All right, Ponka. All right, uh, Mr. Cooper, Jay Cooper. The Jay first, Thomas Cooper. Jay Thomas Cooper. The My first dad was Thomas J. Cooper. Awesome. The first question I have is, where did this nickname Ponka come from? Because that's what we call you. Almost I always. I think Lori put that on me. I'm not positive. Hey, hon? <coughs> where did Ponka come from? I, I heard somewhere that a grandchild or something tried to say grandpa and maybe Ponka came out. That was Ponka, where did that come from? Turn, turn that off. Well, I guess Morgan nicknamed me Ponka. All right. So that out of the way, Ponka. Um, when and where were you born? I was born January 5th, 1943, in actually it was Miami Beach, the hospital on Miami Beach. And my mother was a nurse and had worked at that hospital as well as Jackson Memorial and uh, private duty around Miami. And so she had me at that hospital. Awesome. Um, were there any interesting circumstances regarding your birth or was it a pretty normal delivery? I think it was pretty, pretty normal. I think my father was still here, but he was just about to leave to go to the Pacific Ocean during World War II as a line naval officer aboard a very large ship called the USS Basilon. And so he got to see me for a week or two, I guess, before he left. And he had to go to Norfolk and join his ship. And then he was en route to the Panama Canal to go through it and get to the Pacific where all the action was occurring over west of Hawaii during World War II. All right. What's he, uh, he found out about the birth of Sandy when he was aboard ship uh, way out in the ocean east of, uh, of Jacksonville. The radio operator came to him and said you have a you have a new daughter so I remember sort of that story awesome um, what's what's your most fond memory from when you were born to the end of high school well I don't think it's my fondest memory one of my very earliest memories was in the front room at Maddie Love Cooper's home, my grandmother, who I lived with for the first two or three months, uh, two or three years of my life. She was, she was so, she loved me so much. I just uh, miss her dearly. She was very thoughtful and a wonderful influence on me in my life. And, but I'll, <laughs> But I remember she influenced my tail end some too. <laughs> I had uh, had an accident in my pants and I think she found me. I was hiding in a closet or something uh, half uh, on upstairs. And so I think the smells <laughs> gave away my location. And so she got her switch and I don't think I ever had an accident after that. <laughs> I switch, had a switch, switch is in switchblade or? No, uh, it's a, a cherry switch, which is a very thin but strong branch. Oh, And I she see. would whack on, twacked on me <laughs> with that switch. I think I might have heard that story before. I, I fully remember that she used to <clears throat> cook 
she was a wonderful cook and would put um, make a lots of special food underneath the broiler in her oven and there was this great big table in the dining room and we'd all gather around that table and have sizzling toast she would take toast make toast and then put butter on it and then put it under the the, the grill and it come out sizzling hot and we just loved loved grandma and her cooking and all the fun times that we would she did taking care of us. I lived with her when my mom went to uh, be with my dad. He was severely injured during World War II and um, they were going to set him off in China and he said no no he talked to the, the captain. He was like third in charge of this big huge ship and they had a doctor aboard, so he said, just have the doc trust me up, and I will stay with the ship till we get to the USA, because I don't want to be put off in China or anywhere else. So that's what he did. He flew, they flew him directly from, um, well, he went into Seattle, all the way to, to, uh, to Washington, D.C., and he was at Bethesda um, Hospital there, the Naval Hospital, and he had 10 different operations. And uh, and they said, well, we've done everything that we know what to do. And uh, so, but he was resolved that he was not gonna be in a wheelchair the rest of his life. He kept working physically, and he was, he was a very, large man for those times. He was six foot four and a quarter and he was a very strong athlete. He ran track and won two <clears throat> different um, accolades in, from track. He was a shot put, putter and he shot putted and, and that record uh, stood for many many years at the college that he was at in, in Michigan. And then the coach asked him to throw the javelin at this, uh, and so because the javelin thrower didn't show up for the the meet, so he got Dad to throw the javelin. He'd never thrown the javelin, but he grabbed hold of it and he threw that thing and went further than anybody else. So he had those two different records for his uh, college uh, track team which stood for many years and he was very very athletic he used to play golf and love golf but because of his back injury he couldn't stand any vibration and so we always had large cars like um, large Oldsmobile 98s or Cadillacs or whatever so that he wouldn't have to suffer very much vibration to his back. I remember when he came home from the hospital in Miami, his buddy that he had gone through school with, can't remember his name right now, but he had a he had a dealer car dealership, and so he made a deal. He he made he dad a deal on a on a um, Oldsmobile. Rocket 88, which started the uh, the war <laughs> that occurred between the cars on horsepower and so on for the years after that. So anyway, I remember my father coming home from the war and this great huge man that I just had never remembered ever seeing before grabbed hold of me and <laughs> held me by my by my thighs and held me up above his head which is about nine feet six four plus three more feet to try and pick cherries out of the cherry trees in the front of grandmother Cooper's front yard well I was screaming bloody murder because I, I you know I was way way up there and I didn't understand 
what do you want me to do? So, and then I was also, uh, I remember he had sent home uh, a little, um, a little sailor suit and it was blue and it was all wool and oh, it, it stuck me everywhere. And so they put that on me and I just, I was screaming bloody murder because it was so sticky. And uh, so they thought that I didn't want to be a, a sailor or something, but I didn't want to wear that, that, uh, that costume, which was neat, but uh, it scratched me all over. Well, progressing, another vivid memory I have of my very young life is I was in the front room of my grandmother's house. Everybody else was in the living room, which is adjoining it, and they had the door closed, and I could hear all the people and the noises and everything, and the light coming from around the door and everything, and I was in... Uh, my, you know, playpen or bed. And so what I did is I climbed up out of that bed and I fell off, <laughs> fell over and hit the floor. <laughs> well, some, they heard me because I was screaming bloody murder and I wasn't hurt really. I just, you know, scared to death when I hit the floor. <clears throat> but uh, they paid attention to me after that <laughs> so I need to get a, a picture of your your hair <laughs> I hope that you don't dress like that on your mission which is coming up soon oh no I'll, I'll, look, I'll look much more presentable on uh, the mission. I hope so okay <laughs> all right miles <laughs> Well, I want you to know, Miles, I'm very proud that you have accepted your mission call and you're headed to Salt Lake area, Salt Lake City, for your mission. My friend is going to Salt Lake. I'm going a little bit below it. It's called Orem. Right. Well, that's so Salt Lake to me. It's close, <clears throat> just around it, just south of it. And I know you wanted to go to Japan, but maybe that can happen after you come home from your mission. Yeah, my parents uh, said we need to uh, go on a little trip there, so... Well, good. So, both your dad and your uncle, Todd and Grant, both of my sons, and your your aunt... Um, all three of them. Lana Joy, all did missions and came home very grown up after their mission and did very well and have done very well with their lives since then. <clears throat> if uh, you're aware of where your dad went. Spokane, Washington. Spokane, but he wasn't really in Spokane very much of the time. He was over two, two states away and he opened a mission over there. Um, but uh, then there's uh, Todd, who he was in Washington State, oh, both both of them were sent to the exact opposite of the United States <laughs> from where they lived. And uh, Lana Joy went to the Canary Islands, just uh, west of uh, of North Africa. There, she went to the MTC and in Provo for a couple of weeks and then they, they put her on a plane and she went to the MTC which is in Spain near Madrid, the capital and the temple. And then after that she, she didn't know Spanish well at all but she gained and learned Spanish when she came home from her mission. She actually would think in Spanish. She was that solid with Spanish so she's always been grateful for her mission and those experiences and being able to learn the language well 
where from there? Let's see. What else do you? Well, that that was. I think the question was, what do you remember before um, you graduated? Now, now the time frame is from when you graduated and started going to whatever school to when you got married or before okay. that. <clears throat> well, myself and Carol and Sandy, my sister, younger sister, we all graduated from PK Young. And I went to PK when in the ninth grade. I went through J.J. Finley, where I think Fisher and uh, Fisher, yep. he went there. And it was a, a good, great experience. And then I, after the sixth and seventh grade, which was at Buholtz Junior High School, we I transferred uh, in the ninth grade to PK Young in 9, 10, 11, 12, graduated there. So <clears throat> PK is a fond memory in my heart and uh, I did well there and uh, was not much of a, <clears throat> a sportsman. I played, I, I went out for football, got my, broke my be my uh, shoulder shoulder there and uh, played a little baseball but not much but uh, you know I, I enjoyed sports and I was president of the drama club really for about a year and a half yeah I was uh, well best actor in one of the plays that we put on at the university <clears throat> but uh, so, after high school, I got involved with a fraternity at the University of Florida and majored in party, and I partied hard for, oh, a semester and a half, got way behind in honor points, which is what they called it back then, <clears throat> and dropped out my second semester and went down to the community college in St. Petersburg. And that was one of the few community colleges that existed then, and it was the very best. And some of the courses there were tougher than at Florida. <clears throat> but I managed to do well there and uh, thought I was headed for engineering. and. Um, but the English course had its own reputation. I think I started, I might have started it twice, but uh, I, I made it through English there, and so, so many people were taking it three and four times to get through. But anyway, <clears throat> and so I had a, a, a Plymouth convertible and we had as many as 10 or 12 people in that at times. <laughs> we'd, with the top down, we'd be f flying around St. Pete and so on. And <clears throat> um, I met this guy down there when I was going to the community college. I had taken, I had part, well, I had left the car at a gas station to get the oil changed. and. <clears throat> I came back, I went to dinner, came back to the dinner, and my car was still on the rack. And I walked in and talked to Jerry, the owner, and he says, uh, we got a problem. Um, this is Ken Olson, a good friend of mine, and he owns that T the Thunderbird out there, a black brand new Thunderbird. And he's uh, he was trying to help, and he put a wrench on your gas tank, which was dripping a little bit the bottom flange on the gas tank and he tried to tighten it and it busted and so all my gas basically disappeared and we had to go find another gas tank for it so he put me in his Corvette and we went over to a junkyard and got a, got a tank and came back and then Jerry and he, he put it on and had me where I could go go again. So Ken meanwhile invited me to come see his house and where he stayed. He does he didn't live with his parents. His parents were sales 
salesman and it went all over them and so they had a con they had a home a three bedroom two bath home on the water and so Ken stayed there with a he had a, a housekeeper which cooked for him and cleaned the house an elderly lady <clears throat> and so Ken had quite a life and he and I were very good friends from then on for several years and uh, he had a girlfriend that he had become kind of serious about he had several girlfriends but anyway this one Kathy was um, a very good friend to this, this gal that they both knew Sharon Henniger and so they thought that I should get together with Sharon Henniger. They thought a lot of me and thought of her and thought that we might match each other a little bit. So when they became engaged, they asked me to be the best man and for Sharon to be the maid of honor. And so when they married, we were the best man and maid of honor. And then a few months later, she and I got to know each other real well and decided to join our lives together. They, since then, have come apart, and I think he's probably come apart more than once with other women as well. Haven't seen him for many years, and wonder, I wonder every now and then how he's getting along. I know his father has passed away, and probably his mom too. And uh, <clears throat> but he was a he was a good friend, good friend. Matter of fact, um, he and I were driving in St. Pete, and Ken had outrun the police several times, and so the entire police force was after him, literally, and. Uh, what what are you throwing on the ground? Just a hair. Well, not on our floor, please. And so um, he he. I remember going across the bridge from St. Pete Beach to the mainland at 160 miles an hour. <laughs> not my safest or best memory, but um, Ken had quite a reputation. Anytime they would see that black Corvette, they'd, they'd get right on it and stay and, and just, you know, hound him to death. So anyway, we were out one evening, um, or one afternoon, and he took a corner kind of quick and it, and it uh, busted one of his tires. It went flat. And so then the police sort of found us and uh, Ken had asked me to slide over and say I was driving because he had several interchanges with the police that he didn't want to, they were going to put him, they were going to arrest him and, and so on. So he knew he, it was time for him to get out of Dodge. And uh, so anyway, I said, yeah, oh yeah, I'd had the flat tire. And we fit, changed the tire and and then about a week later, it was Christmas, and I was home, and he comes up and he talks me into going to Chicago with him. So he and I drove up to Chicago that, that uh, next day and a half, and we <laughs> had another incident. I was driving, he was asleep next to me, and we were coming up to an intersection in Gary, Indiana, just below Chicago. And we'd been tailing this Thunderbird who had been going 80 or 100 miles on all the back roads going up to Chicago. He knew it like the back of his hand. And so we just tailed him for all that time. And so I was coming up to this intersection and I couldn't see any different. The road looked normal. But I that then found out it had rime ice all over it, thin ice layer, which you can't really see. And so I'd, I'd put the brake on two or three times, 
slowing down and it seemed like it would actually speed up <laughs> because the tires would just slide and uh, so anyway there were two cars there was a Thunderbird here and there was another car there and it was a four lane highway two four lane highways that meet and there was just enough room between those two for the Corvette to go between them and I knew it wasn't we weren't going fast, but I knew it just wasn't going to get it completely stopped before I got to them. So I aimed it right for those two. But there was a railroad track right behind the, these cars. And the, the front end of that Corvette went up when it went over the railroad track and put me right halfway into the, the trunk of the T-Bird. So I thought, well, there goes my life. But of course... Ken's dad had fully insured the car. He got a brand new car off of, out of it, and he, Ken wasn't mad at all about it. He was glad to get rid of the Corvette because he was going to be married soon, and he wanted a bigger car for them to to have. So we caught the train into uh, Chicago, and I, I'll never forget. I had my black suit on, Florida suit and I about froze to death because it, we were only a few blocks off of the lake and that wind came over the lake oh man it must have been I think it was about 20 degrees 18 degrees when we got there and we literally about froze to death before we made it to the condominium that his dad owned that we stayed in for about three or four months so anyway, Ken got a job as a fuller brush man and was making good money. And I got a job, a technical job, with a large plant out west of Chicago in North Lake. And it was a large plant where about 8,000 workers worked. And um, I had to drive, I commuted out there with a, a bunch of other people that, that worked there. And when it was when it was clear, it took an hour and a half to get out there with the traffic. But when it snowed, it took two and a half hours out and back. That's five hours out of your life. And I, I'll never forget, I remember city buses going sideways across the road because they didn't have any traction traction in the snow and everybody was you know smashing up and so we had to be very careful commuting but I was a telephony engineer telephone I engineered telephone exchanges for the large offices all over the United States for General Telephone, and I would I had my desk in there, in this big huge room at the plant had 150 engineers with each one of us had our desks, and then back of us were all the draftsmen, the people that drew all the where where this equipment went and so on. So we had an inbox and an outbox on our desk and our telephone. And that's what we had is this, this this desk with a and so all the stuff that they wanted me to work on they'd put in my inbox and I'd work on it and then put it in the the outbox and then go to the draftsman. So I did that for several months and I also took a course with the fellow that had invented the uh, transistor. He worked for General Telephone at that time and. I was privileged to be able to get into that class and be exposed to some pretty smart people. So summer was coming and my mom and dad, he was retired Navy and so he could fly space available. And whenever they had space on aircraft, he could show up at the base and hop aboard and get free flights. Um, so he and mom got space and, and invited me to come and Sandy, Sandy and I to go and we all went to Europe that summer. I had to get all these inoculations before I could go and I just found 
my Borgward Isabella Touring Sports Coupe, which is a little German sports car that I've had all these years. And uh, I remember finding that it was in a larger, well, it was parked next to a big apartment house down on the lake. And I left a note for the guy and he called me and so I didn't have to pay too much for it because they'd just gone out of production and the guy was afraid afraid of it. So I was able to, to get my, my car and drive it down to um, where all the, the Air, Air Force flights go out of the United States to Europe and uh, uh, South North, North Carolina. And so I met them there and we hopped aboard and went to Frankfurt and stayed in Frankfurt for a couple of days at a hotel and then toured several places around Frankfurt and Germany and Luxembourg and France and, and so on for a couple of weeks. And then, or I guess it was maybe a week and a half then we started worrying about getting home because, you know, the summer was close, coming to a close. So we went to Rhine Mine Air Base where we had been, we landed and to get flights back out. And the same sort of system occurred there. You had to be there with all your luggage ready to go every day. And they only let one or two people on because the, the, the flights were full. And so we realized that after doing, doing that for a week and a half or so that all the midshipmen and everybody else that had been to, to Europe that summer, they were catching the same flights trying to get home. And we were down the list from then because they were still military and they had, you know, presence above us. So we had to, dad had to pay $1,500 each tickets for us to fly home <laughs> because he had to be back and I had to be back and mom everybody so that was pretty cheap going over but it cost us dearly coming home so we got to see some of uh, other cultures and, and uh, countries and, and so on and that was a, a nice experience. We thoroughly enjoyed that European trip. And I have a great big mug around here somewhere. It's about this tall and a beer mug or whatever. And I don't know where that is right now, but it's here somewhere. I've had that all ever since. Why don't you uh, why don't you switch topics to your your love for aircraft? Well, I flew over on a on a, um, well, a super constellation prop, a four four engine prop, and uh, it took about nine hours to to get there. Coming home, we were on jets and uh, with the $1,500 tickets. And they came back in about seven hours. And I just, you know, I, I've always loved flying and everything about airplanes and things. And so when I graduated from college with my bachelor's degree, my in-laws, Herman and Wilma, Sharon's mom and dad, gave me a gift for graduation of $500. Back then, mm. you could get your, your pilot's license. It would cost you, actually, it didn't cost me that much because I was very quick, I was a very quick learner. I soloed in six hours. Most people take 25 or 30 hours to solo. Or so, 40. Solo meaning you didn't need someone else in the plane? Correct. You that's flew that's by amazing. yourself. So I'd done five or six lessons, and then I jumped in the airplane, and my instructor was with me, and we went around once or twice, I can't remember, and did some maneuvers. And then he 
we landed and he jumps out and he says okay take it and so <laughs> there I was so I was able to solo and I soloed from then on um, so we own part of five different six airplanes Cherokee 180 a 140 air conditioned a 235 a Cherokee 6 and then we had a re, uh, then we had a Cherokee 6 was my favorite airplane and then we had one Cessna at the end and that was Triangle Air Corporation and I was part of the part of that for several years and was treasurer or whatever and then vice president of it and then at the very end I guess I was president of it but uh, we had several professors and people that wanted to fly but didn't want to own an airplane by themselves because it's pretty expensive we we uh, took care of one airplane at a time so that's always been uh, important to me and then Miles, you and I, we we did Oshkosh, oh, yeah. which is a big celebration up in Wisconsin once a year in August, July, August, and that's where all these airplanes from all over the world, people that can build their own airplanes and did, have built their own airplanes, they fly in, and then all different kinds of airplanes come, uh, commercial and military and everything. About 10,000 air, aircraft come in to Oshkosh and about 150,000 people from all over the world. I'll never forget one year that I went, uh, it was about four or five years ago, and I got to, uh, I flew into Milwaukee, which is a major city near Oshkosh, and then you got to go about an hour north to Oshkosh, but uh, I met a pilot and his son and they were from South Africa they were going to Oshkosh <laughs> and so we we shared a rental car and and went up to Oshkosh and you and I we had problem with our rental car they had screwed it up but we found also a guy that wanted to was going to Oshkosh as well so we've had some good trips to Oshkosh, good experiences. They have all sorts of, you know, there's all these airplanes you can look at and then they, Friday and Saturday, they have all these activities going on, all these air show things. And usually the Blue Angels are, are, are there doing aerobatics and um, then they have all these courses that you can take like for welding or covering uh, airplanes with cloth and uh, you know all sorts of uh, things to help you build an airplane and you can actually actually can you actually help build one airplane didn't you did you do some s s s no I don't think I'd built one I, I remember going to a, weld a welding class okay I remember going to see all the different massage chairs in the warehouse and all the different technologies that are being developed. That was the... Yeah. And I also remember you getting us into the VIP, VIP section of some uh, restaurant or something. Oh, okay. And then also, you know, playing hide-and-seek with you, trying to find you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are a million people. Well, not a million, but there are... 150,000 people there and, and that a lot of people camp there mm -hmm. uh, through the week and the uh, the whole experience of having to hitchhike there well we didn't hitchhike but I, I would call that hitchhiking we didn't we shared the car with the other fellow who gave us a nice to give us a ride yeah because our rental car got kiboshed so anyway that's Oshkosh, and that was fun. I have been a lot of places. I've always enjoyed traveling. I had a job with Heat Pipe Technology for about almost nine years, and I traveled all over the United States 
teaching engineers and um, architects all about humidity and how it works, how it goes straight through dry. Heat pipe technology was conned in, um, invented putting a heat pipe on top on an air conditioner and it makes the air conditioner get twice the water out of the air that it normally will. So anyway, I went all over the United States um, teaching the reps and the people that represented a heat pipe in the different areas and the engineers and architects that specify it. So that's what one of the main jobs I did. First job I ever had was on Northwest 16th Street and 13th which is now a sports store but it was a grocery store back then and my job was to take all the cans off the shelf paint the shells and then put all the cans back. <laughs> oh, okay. And so it was uh, Jimmy's Red and White grocery store. <clears throat> um, my second, I don't, oh, my summer job when I was in high school and beyond, I was surveying. I was uh, on a surveying crew for the state road department and we'd go all over all over North Florida um, surveying and, and, and setting lines and, and doing uh, topography studies of how much air, what, land they had taken out of bar, bar holes and things to build roads and stuff. So I had sort of technical jobs when I was growing up, which was good because I've always enjoyed science and I've loved, I've taken lots of science in college and, and I taught physics for 10 years, seven, six and, a, six and a half years at Gainesville High School and then almost four years at the community college. And uh, so anyway, I have enjoyed lots of the jobs that I have and then I've always had my own business sort of on the side and late, lately the last 35 or 40 years I've had my own business which has been CEI Cooper Equipment Incorporated and Cooper Properties and uh, we have some rental properties some four houses and, and five mobile homes and lots out in Arredondo Estates, which I maintain. I'm about ready to get rid of some of those. So I keep busy with all kinds of stuff. Um, like I say, I had traveled all the way, uh, about you name it, and I have been there all over the United States. I've been to Canada, I've been to Cuba, I've been to Hawaii, I've been to many of the countries in Europe, Af um, France, I haven't been to England except to, in an airplane just stop there <laughs> to refuel, but uh, I've been to Germany and Switzerland and all over the place. My favorite city I think in the world is in Switzerland or that's my favorite country and uh, so anyway I've gotten around a fair amount and I thoroughly enjoyed seeing Hawaii with with uh, Lisa and Wade and family and uh, so I, I don't have too much left on my bucket list, but I'd love to do some more traveling. So that's sort of me. Awesome. Other questions? Uh, yeah, just uh, I know you, some of your signature catchphrases include pronouncing Miami, Miami. Um, 
or just your nickname Ponka. Is there any uh, any other things like lingo? I don't remember much. Uh, you kids pick up on it, but to me, it's it's very natural. What's that say? In Miami, that's just normal. That's the, Miami is Miami. What's that one saying when you are on a car in a car on the beach and y'all go back and forth, back and forth? Oh well, that's how you keep from getting stuck in the sand. You pack pack the uh, the sand. No, but I, th- I I don't know if they like named it something. I don't know if you said something funny. I don't, no, I, I just I don't remember that one. Okay, well I don't think there's any particular name to it or something. But it's well, a technique to mm-hmm. not get stuck. <laughs> you have any? Uh, and it, oh, you let some of the air out of the tires too. Oh yeah, yeah. And so then you don't forget to put more air back in when you're on the hard road. Mm-hmm. Do you have any advice for any great great grandchildren about life? Listen to your parents. They have been there and done that and they know the best the best tracks to go. And teach your children to work hard and to be able to work hard. All of our children we didn't mamby pamby with them. We made them work when they were young, and that has paid off in spades in later life for all of them. Todd is well employed. Grant is well employed. Lori is well employed. Lisa as well is is a busy house a mom, and and Lisa has her own business. Well, and they all are very successful, and the people that they marry, they have learned to pick out people that have the same values, and the church has meant a great deal in our lives, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It has helped guide us and helped us realize what is really truly important and what isn't and follow the church and let it be your backbone and show you what to do and where to go and how to do it. All right. Thank you so much. I hope we can uh, um, do this again sometime, maybe after my mission. It be fun, and I appreciate your hard work yesterday helping on the, uh, on the mobile home. All right. You're... When you want to be, you can be a hard worker, a good worker. All right. I love you, Ponko. I love you.